Consider the map, a two-dimensional representation of the area of land or sea showing physical features such as streets, highways, cities and states, and other geographic boundaries and sites. Specific maps also represent decades of residential segregation, urban toxicity, colonial expansion, and historic trauma. Even the seemingly neutral spatial representations of Los Angeles suggest disruptions in articulations of white privilege. Fellow panelist George Lipsitz eloquently has brought to our attention how white privilege enables us to account for a more structural, less conscious, and more deeply historicized understanding of racism. White privilege differs from a hostile individual discriminatory act in that it refers to the privileges and benefits that accrue to white people by virtue of their whiteness and that it produces racial inequality as it systematically undermines the well-being of non-white populations. Los Angeles urban design is an expression of white privilege, particularly the discretion of Chicano communities with the building of freeway systems and the persistent underdevelopment of remaining neighborhoods. My goal today is to document how multiple Chicano arts organizations participated in community making as a strategy against white privilege, or as Professor Lipsitz has written on the occasion of another Chicano exhibition, art making is community making. Although the exhibition Mapping Another LA charts the histories of nine arts organizations, allow me to detour somewhat from this important survey by expanding our awareness to include arts organizations that have not yet been mined from public memory. My presentation today, as you've heard, is based on oral histories and archival research, and it aims to contextualize what we know of these nine and suggest even more robust articulations of space and place through uh, through the arts by interweaving accounts of an additional five institutions. Mexicano Art Center and Goa's art studios and gallery were the earliest venues to support Chicano artists, but they were rapidly joined by other arts organizations in Chicano Los Angeles. And a brief description of the range of arts organizations demonstrates two factors. The dynamism of Chicano cultural production and the aesthetic discourse taking place in Los Angeles. Beginning in 1969, Chicano Los Angeles witnessed a flourishing of cultural centers and artist groups. Collectively, these arts organizations document the civic engagement and artistic vitality within the city. Only five groups have continued into the present, and while it is generally understood that these groups, three arts organizations, one artist collective, and one design company, are sustaining the legacy of the Chicano civil rights movement by consistently offering arts education supporting art production, sponsoring exhibitions, and or advocating for arts and artists. It's important to document how the organizations and artist collectives that no longer exist also shape critical consciousness about art, politics, representation, vernacular aesthetics, and space. For example, Centro Joaquin Murieta de Aslan, a nonprofit organization directed by Josefa Sanchez and Al Alfonso Bias, Bias in East Los Angeles illustrates the debates among artists about representation and appropriation. Centro Joaquin supported street arts as relevant artistic style and practice and rejected the art market system because it is, quote, non-relevant to humans, end quote, who were without the money to buy goods and services. It also found most satisfying a creative visual expression in and for the streets. In the early 1970s, it produced, produced a chalk-in in Belvedere Park to visualize contemporary messages. And the founders celebrated this activity as their most successful initiative. Similar then to muralists who challenged the art market system for its emphasis on commodification and objectification, Centro Joaquin aimed to produce and display art that did not rely on capitalist transactions. They also planned Chicano University, an autonomous institution to employ local artists who would design and teach bilingual and bicultural courses in the performing arts fine arts, and communications. The co-founders recognized this, their, their economic challenges they faced, especially, though, because they were dissatisfied with the infrastructure intended to finance nonprofit arts organizations. They voiced a collective sentiment. Arts funding, they said, had too many strings attached, and it often resulted in cultural appropriation. Established in 1977, Centro de Arte Publico most clearly expressed the critical consciousness about public and private agencies' influence on the arts. 
Centro de Arte Público was an artist collective in Highland Park that operated for approximately three years. Co-founded by Carlos Almaraz, Guillermo Bejarano, and Richard Duardo, its membership maneuvered the boundaries between politics, art, and commerce. It was a significant cultural experiment that tried to work outside of the public funding circuit and its concomitant limits on representation. The members, including Barbara Carrasco, Dolores Cruz, Roberto Tito Delgado, Leo Limon, Frank Romero, John Valadez, and George Yepes, had witnessed firsthand the restrictive role that public funding played at Mexicano, GOES, and self-help graphics, and they viewed compromise as untenable conditions for artistic production. In 1976, Carlos Almaraz provided the leadership and political vision that would encourage the formation of the collective. Upon returning from a, a recent statewide meeting of Concilio de Arte Popular, Almaraz was dismayed by the, a subtle censorship and overt control of activities that came with public fiscal support. According to Richard Duardo, Almaraz invited several artists to his studio on Figueroa Avenue to talk about, quote, the use of public funds by Centros Culturales in California and how it limits political action and ideology, end quote. During the meeting, Almaraz challenged the group to become, and I quote, the cultural vanguard of the revolution and to eschew decorative escapist art for the elite bourgeois, but to offer our services in the struggle of the proletariat. He said that with a smile, by the way. Armadas's call for economic autonomy inspired the group that night, and the Centro Arte Popular was formed. Arte Publico was formed. Aesthetic and political independence translated into a small business venture, producing murals for Los Angeles clients and creating posters and signs for local merchants. The desire for economic and aesthetic autonomy, aesthetic autonomy could not sustain the entire membership and only a few members obtained contracts for work, notably John Valadez, who sold prints based on his photographs of Cholos, or earned commissions to paint murals to the citywide My Mural Project. However, the 5,000 square feet of open studio space in Highland Park did successfully support intense artistic dialogue and debate. This practice of discursive engagement was an important characteristic that helped sustain Chicano arts organizations, even when funding was scarce. It was the physical space for artists to share ideas, comment on each other's work, and experience somatic and transcendent qualities of art making that led to the remapping of Los Angeles and the arts. Whether formally staged or spontaneously embraced, Centro de Arte Público, as well as Mexicano, Goez, and self-help graphics, became spaces that generated vigorous discussions about art, politics, and the role of artists. Some of these assemblies were serendipitous gatherings, and others were formal membership meetings, such as the ones at Centro. And artists returned over and over again because of the energizing atmosphere created by that dialogue. They explored a new visual language and ideological formation in conversation. These freewheeling discussions in the context of art making served to further craft in the 1970s what it meant to be un centro cultural, a space for that firestorm of creative energy and ideas that flowed and supported the aesthetic process among a broad range of artists. As noted in the example of Centro Joaquin, East Side arts organizations were advancing the creation of new spaces for learning and new pedagogies. Mexicano, Plaza de la Raza, Mexican American Center for the Creative Arts, Nosotros, and Self-Help Graphics offered a range of arts classes, visual arts, dance, music, theater, and creative writing. They taught jazz at Mexicano. Their curriculum exercised indigenous arts, Mexican aesthetics, and Chicano vernacular expressions, such as street theater and urban calligraphy. Folklorico and danzante were taught, not ballet. A central component to the alternative education was the utilization of Chicano artists as instructors, as formers of knowledge. For example, United Chicano Artists aimed to place um, Chicano artists within the public school system, a strategy that self-help graphics also employed through its Barrio Mobile Art Studio. United Chicano Artists crafted bilingual, bicultural curriculum materials and offered training to teachers in elementary school. Manuel Cruz, the founder of United Chicano Artists, produced for primary grades the Chicano Bilingual Coloring Book with pictures of Aztec children, toys, and heroes, as well as costumes of ancient Mexican culture. 
This curri curriculum mapped an indigenous image bank for Chicano identity. Taking a different pedagogical strategy than most Chicano arts, uh, arts organizations that educated children and young adults, Nosotros directed its efforts towards professionals in the entertainment industry. Founded by Gil Avila, Nosotros engaged the cultural logic that new images of Chicano artists would produce societal change. Rather than scrutinizing the dominant representations of Chicanos, Nosotros emphasized the dialectic relationship between artistic expression and new subjectivities. In this way, Nosotros offered writing workshops to produce new material for film and television, thereby, and I quote, eliminating the stereotype while also providing work for our actors. They illustrated that critical consciousness about representation, looking at authorship, signification, and intention. The new image bank emerged from the visual and cultural vernacular expressions of the community and many arts organizations. They were drawn to urban calligraphy, indigenous references, tattoos, gardens, as you heard Magu say in the video, home altars, and other private aesthetics. To gain more autonomy over images in the process of mural production, Judy Baca and her co-founders formally incorporated SPARC as a nonprofit organization in 1976 after two years of supporting the citywide mural project. Baca found inspiration from participants' lives, family histories, and community struggles, as well as the images they made in their sketchbooks on the skin, on their own skin as tattoos, and the aesthetics that they developed in graffiti. Baca's leadership in the citywide mural project and later in Spark facilitated the production of nearly 190 murals in Los Angeles by the end of the 1970s. At one point, Spark and Mexicano competed for walls and artistic authority. But when Baca Berdan, Berdan began production on the Great Wall in 1976, the competition fizzled. In several ways, the competitive spirit could not be reconciled with the collective call for solidarity within the Chicano community or the employment offered by Spark, though patriarchy did continue to influence arts production on the east side. Several artists, such as Judith Hernandez, Irene Cervantes, Patsy Valdez, Willie Heron, Wayne Healy, and David Oteo, found work through Spark. And most had also painted murals with Mexicano. Mobility and economic stability were concurrent strategies within Chicano arts um, scene. The atmosphere in Chicano Los Angeles was dynamic, but also limiting for women. While the majority of arts organizations were storefront neighborhood art centers, Plaza de la Raza is the only Chicano arts institution built from the ground up. It began in 1969 when a community campaign to save the boathouse in Lincoln Park, um, when a community mo mounted a campaign to save the boathouse in Lincoln Park. It echoed the other um, battles uh, with municipal authorities when we were trying to win uh, approval from murals or other public spaces. Plaza de la Laza is an assertion of territorial power and political control over city, city authorities who sought to raise the historic boathouse situated in Lincoln Park and reclassify its use to outsiders. Um, it eventually identified the boathouse as its initial facility for a larger community center, which Leonard Castellanos noted in a recent interview would focus on the arts as an intentional strategy to solidify a broad group of constituents. Indeed, Plaza de la Raza illustrates how a flexible economic and political strategy can generate an unprecedented level of financial support. Plaza organizers, with Frank Lopez and Mexican actress Margo Albert at the helm, raised $300,000 within 13 months from supporters in labor, education, politics, business, and the local residents. With fewer resources, self-help graphics and arts made self-determination and aesthetic autonomy the pillar of its mission. Founded in 1972 but active in 1970, the co-founders, sister Karen Bocalero, Carlos Bueno, Antonio Ibanez, and Frank Hernandez were centrally interested in nurturing young artists while supporting the Chicano cultural identity and pride emerging in East Los Angeles. At Self-Help Graphics, the main art form was printmaking, not murals. Sister Karen's own arts training and interest supported this interest on printmaking, but it was her strategic planning that resulted in Self-Help Graphics' most influential arts program the celebrations, exhibitions, and performances for Dia de los Muertos. 
Since 1972, Self-Help Graphics has marked the Day of the Dead with a spatial and spiritual reconfiguration of Los Angeles. At the first celebration, a small group of artists, including Linda Vallejo and Peter Tovar, uh, created an una ofrenda and shared a meal with this small group. But in later years, residents and artists made installations to honor the dead, processed through the streets, and offered prayers and dances for the dead at multiple locations. The synergy of artistic spiritual expression became the unique contribution of self-help graphics to Los Angeles and to the wider community. Even during its most unstable period, Southern California was able to grow on the work that was founded at self Help Graphics, and we now witness the Day of the Dead celebrations and exhibitions throughout the region. Indeed, just the other day, thousands of people continue to make the pilgrimage to self Help Graphics for its annual Dia de los Muertos procession and altar installations. Similar to self Help Graphics print shops, which allowed artists to sell their work directly to the collectors, Economic viability was the major strategy of Aura, an arts organization that advanced the dialogue in Los Angeles about fair wages and quality of life issues for artists. Aura focused on, quote, collective bargaining, co-ops, legal aid, alternative education, group exhibitions, and unionization of artists. Chairman of the organization, Alvaro Lopez, noted at the inaugural meeting, Aura functions on the principles that artists are legitimate workers and entitled to all the wages, rights, and benefits given to any worker. Reformulating the Maoist role of the artist in society, Aura embraced worker rights discourse for a population of laborers typically defined as underproductive or unproductive, superfluous, and unconventional, and thus outside of civil rights campaigns. Aura advocated with Centro and Mexicano that artists were critical to creating social transformation. Now, by way of conclusion, I return to the maps of Goez. Building on the organic collecting traditions of Mexicans and Chicanos who saved calendars or, or religious cards for home display, Goez produced maps as collectible items, as something people could frame, Juan Gonzalez noted, something they could keep with pride. The Goez maps are significant in two ways. They function spatially and geographically to locate the community or gallery within a larger territorial context and they visually articulate the political and aesthetic authority of the community. The maps produced by Goas are interventions against white privilege. With the words, in Europe, all roads lead to Rome, in Southern California, all freeways lead to East Los Angeles, the co-founders Juan Gonzalez, Joe Gonzalez, and David Boteo reversed the structures of empire. Unlike the Roman transport system, which supported imperialist expansion through a network of roads leading to and from the empire center, the freeways of Los Angeles were designed to direct the movement of people and their money towards the suburbs and away from the inner city. But Goa's co-founders reordered the folklore of the freeway, the phrase Eric Avila uses to read the conduits for cultural elites in Anglo-American suburbanites. This gesture towards a destination outside the urban core is a spatial reversal that encompasses all of East Los Angeles as the destination of cultural and aesthetic authority. Created and laid out by John Juan Gonzalez and designed and drawn by David Boteo, the map precisely illustrates the location of 271 individual mural locations in, quote, East Los Angeles, California, United States of America, Mexico, Aslan. This line further reorders geopolitical spatiality. The map is a visual and textual gesture about the transnational and transhistorical subjectivity and belonging. Furthermore, the map uses the head of Quetzalcoatl as the god is uh, depicted in sculptural form at Teotihuacan to indicate the four cold cardinal directions, another powerful spatial allegory that temporally links East Los Angeles to an indigenous past that serves literally as the compass for contemporary bearings. In addition, the map is framed in Mesoamerican step fret designs and European filigree patterns. To the right of Quetzalcoatl is a revision of the uh, Mexican revolutionary slogan, Tierra y Libertad becomes Tierra por Libertad. The map is a proclamation about Chicano spatial temple authority in East Los Angeles. Goez could not change the course of the freeway, but they could change its meaning and map another history of belonging. Thank you.